Hi, today we're going to be learning about histograms. We're going to start off by quickly talking about what a histogram is. A histogram is a graphical representation of data using bars of different lengths to show the frequency of the data divided into intervals. Histograms are used to represent continuous data. This is data that can be measured, and continuous data can include decimal values, as opposed to discrete data, which is what we were using when we were doing bar graphs. Discrete data is data that can be counted, and it can only include whole numbers. So continuous data, which is what we're going to be working with now, is data that can be measured and it can include decimal values. Now let's have a look at the rules that we need to follow when we are drawing a histogram. So first of all, here's an example of a histogram. So in this histogram, you are being shown the number of learners in a class that spend different amounts of time on social media. First of all, just like for a bar graph, you have to label everything. So the very first thing is you have to have a label or a title for your graph saying what the graph is about. And you also have to have your axes labeled as well to say what each of those axes is representing. Then, unlike for a bar graph, we do not have any gaps between our bars. With a bar graph, you have to have gaps and they must all be the same with each other. But for a histogram, you must not have any gaps between the bars. The only time you might have any open space in between bars is if one of the bars has a zero value, then that bar will leave an open space. But it's not a gap between the bars, it's that one of the bars actually is equal to zero. Then the next thing is, just like for a bar graph, your vertical axis has to have a consistent scale interval. Okay, you can't have it going up in twos and then going up in fives and then going up in tens. It has to be consistent and the gaps must all be the same size as each other so that it, so the person who's reading the graph will be able to interpret it accurately. Then unlike for a bar graph, for a histogram, you have a scale on the horizontal axis as well and they must also be consistent. Okay, so you've got, in this case, is counting in tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and you can see that the actual bars, unlike for a bar graph, the bars had to be labeled. On a histogram, it's not the same. On a histogram, your scale has to be labeled, and the bars kind of fit into that scale. It's, a, it's different from a bar graph, where the bars represent something. Here, the bars are representing the space between the different numbers, and that's because we're working with continuous data. So this bar is representing all the numbers from 0 to 10. This bar is representing all the numbers from 10 to 20. This bar is representing all the values from 20 to 30. This one is all the values from 30 to 40 and so on. So your histogram, the horizontal axis is also going to have a number line type of look just like your vertical axis does over here. Okay, now we're going to talk about the intervals that we use when we are working with a histogram. Now this is the kind of interval that you would be used to from when we were working with frequency tables and bar graphs and that's because they were working with discrete data up to this point. But now we are going to learn how to do intervals for continuous data and this is what intervals for continuous data look like. The reason it's different is because continuous data as I said earlier can include decimal values. So over here this interval ended at 9 and this one ended at 10 so there could be nothing in between the 9 and the 10 so what happens if you have a value of 9.5 or 9.8 you have to have allowance for that when you're working with continuous data so for continuous data our intervals look different because we are allowing for all decimal values up to the number 10 but not including the number 10 in the first interval so here this symbol is saying that x or whatever value we're putting into this interval can be greater than or equal to 0, but it must be less than 10, and it cannot be equal to 10. That's why it doesn't have a less than or equal to sign up here. It just has a less than sign. So whatever value fits into this interval will be something that is, it can be equal to 0, but it can also be greater than 0 so long as it is less than 10. If it is equal to 10, it goes into this interval. If it is greater than 10 but less than 20, it also goes into this interval. However, if our value is, is equal to 20 or greater than 20 but less than 30, it goes into this interval. If it is greater than or equal to 30 but less than 40, it goes into this interval. If it is greater than or equal to 40 and less than 50, it goes into this interval. 
If it is greater than or equal to 50 and less than 60, it goes into this interval. And finally, if it is greater than or equal to 60 and less than 70, it goes into this interval. So that is what our intervals will look like when we're working with continuous data. Now, you might sometimes see intervals still written like this. If you happen to be working with, it's still continuous data, but if you happen to be working with data that even though it is measurable data, it still actually only includes whole numbers, then you might be given the intervals like this. But as soon as you're working with decimal values, you have to do the intervals like this. Otherwise, you're not making allowance for those values that can be in between the upper limit and the lower limit of two consecutive intervals. So you can't have something in between the 9 and the 10 if there's nowhere for it to go. Okay, so that's why we're going to be putting our intervals or using intervals like this when we are doing continuous data for our histograms. So let's have a look at our first example over here. In this example, it says that the following list shows how much money each learner in a class spent at the tuck shop for one week. If you don't have the worksheet that goes with this lesson, please quickly pause the video and copy this down. Okay, so now we're going to go and we're going to use that data and we're going to fill in a frequency table, which we will then use to make a histogram. But first of all, we're going to fill in the frequency table. So here is our frequency table. Once again, if you don't have the worksheet, quickly pause the video and copy this down. Okay, so now we're going to go and fill in our frequency table. So I'm going to start you off with this just to show you how it works when you're working with decimal values, because we haven't done that before. And then we're going to, then I'll let you continue and finish it on your own. Okay, so over here, I have got all of the values that we're going to be working with, and I've got my frequency table. So first of all, I've got 8.55. Now 8.55 is in the interval 5 to 10. Okay, so that's going to go over there. It's between 5 and 10. So I cross that out. Then I do the next one, 12.82. That goes in the 10 to 15 interval. So I put a tally mark over there, and I cross that out. Then the next one, 9 rand 80 goes in the 5 to 10 interval, so that goes over there, and I cross that out. Now this one over here, 10 rand, be careful, I've got a 10 over there, and I've also got a 10 over there, I have to make sure I put it into the correct interval. Remember this one is less than 10, it's not equal to 10. So the 10 isn't going to go in this one, it's going to go in this one, because x can be equal to 10 in this interval. So the 10 is going to go in this interval, over there and then I cross that out. Okay, so now I started you off, so now I'm going to give you three minutes to complete this frequency table by yourself.
Okay, so let's quickly go through what that should look like. So this is what your tally chart or your frequency table should look like. You should find that there were 12 learners in the zero to five bracket. There are 10 learners in the five to 10 interval, 10 or eight in the 10 to 15 interval, four in the 15 to 20 interval. There were no learners in the 20 to 25 or the 25 to 30 intervals. And there was one learner in the 30 to 35 interval. Okay, so that is what your frequency table should look like. And you should have found the total was 35 altogether. That's how many learners there are in the class altogether. Okay, so now you need to draw a histogram to represent the data in this frequency table. And I'm going to give you five minutes to work on this.
Okay, so let's have a look at what your graph should look like. So over here, I've got the graph that yours should look similar to this. Okay, I chose to use intervals of twos. You might have chosen to do uh, just counting in ones if you wanted to. That's entirely up to you. I wouldn't recommend doing intervals that are bigger than twos for this particular graph. Over here on the horizontal axis, you obviously are counting in fives because that's what the intervals were that you were given. Okay, so in the zero to five interval, we have got 12 learners, as you can see in our frequency table over there. In five to 10, we had 10 learners. In 10 to 15, we had eight learners. Then in 15 to 20, we had four learners. We had nobody in 20 to 30 at all. And then we had one learner in the 30 to 35 uh, interval. Now, this one learner is what we would possibly consider a an outlier. Okay, somebody who's outside of the normal range for this particular class. Right, now let's have a look at our next example. Now, in this example, you've been given a histogram and you're going to have to answer questions based on the data in this histogram. I'm just going to quickly show you the lines over here so that you can more easily see the different the values all the way across because you, you obviously can't hold a ruler as easily against this graph when it's on the screen, okay? But normally, if you're doing this on paper, I recommend using a ruler to line up and see exactly what value each of these bars is representing. Okay, now you're going to have to answer questions. I'm going to give you a few seconds for each question. The first question, question A, what information is this graph giving us? What is this graph telling us? Okay, question B. Why was a histogram chosen to represent this data? Question C. How many learners are in this class? Okay, question D. How many learners have a height in the interval 140 to 145? Question E. How many learners are less than 145 centimeters tall? Question F. How many learners are at least 1.5 meters tall? G, provide a suitable label for the vertical axis or the y-axis. And then the last question, question H, what is the purpose of the zigzag before the first bar on the horizontal axis or the x-axis, the zigzag over here? What do you think that is for? Okay, so let's go through each of those questions. First one, question A, was what information is this graph giving us? So the title of the graph is the heights of the learners in a class 
and then over here we're also told height in centimeters for the horizontal axis so we're going to use that information to answer this question so what we know is that this graph is telling us about the heights of learners in a particular class in centimeters we, that's the information that we're getting from this graph okay the next question why was a histogram chosen to represent this data this data is being represented with the histogram because height is a continuous form of data it is data that can be measured so it is continuous data that's why we're using a histogram for this data the next question question c how many learners are in this class we had to add up we had to see how many there were in each of the bars and we had to add that all up so the first one over here is one then this is nothing so we don't have to worry about it then we've got two then we've got four over here over here we've got seven then this one over here is ten this one is eight here we've got uh, five then we've got three then we've got one and we've got another one so when we add all of those up you should get 42 learners altogether that's how many learners there are in the class the next question how many learners have a height in the interval 140 to 145 so that is this one over here we're just looking at that bar and that is seven learners altogether okay so that's what you should have got for that question Question E, how many learners are less than 145 centimeters tall? So this is 145 centimeters over there. So all the learners that are less than that are going to be on the left of that on our graph. So we're going to start over here. We've got one in 120 to 125. We've got nothing over there, so we don't have to worry about that. Then we've got two in 130 to 135. Then we've got four in 135 to 140. And then we've got seven in 140 to 145. We don't continue because we have to work out how many there are that are less than 145. So we stop there. And that adds up to 14 learners altogether. Then the next question, how many learners are at least 1.5 meters tall? So 1.5 meters, first of all, you had to know that 1.5 meters is the same as 150 centimeters. When we're converting from meters to centimeters, we multiply by 100. So we had to multiply 1.5 by 100 and that gives us 150. So we want to know how many learners are at least 150 centimeters tall. So we're going from here and at least means it can be more than 150, it can't be less. So we're going from this 150 and we're going to the right over here. So we're adding all of those up. So we've got this one over here is 8 plus 155 to 160 is 5 plus 160 to 165 is 3, plus 165 to 170 is 1, plus another 1 for 170 to 175. And that all adds up to 18 learners. So that's what we should have got for question F. And then for question G, we need to provide a suitable label for the vertical axis or the y-axis. Now remember, whenever you draw a histogram, you're supposed to label everything. Now this graph was given to you without a label for the y-axis over here. So we are going to provide a label for that. Now we know that this is about the heights of learners in a class. So this is telling us about the number of learners that have each of these heights. So our label will be number of learners. And then the last question, what is the purpose of the zigzag before the first bar on the horizontal axis or the x-axis? Now this zigzag over here is something we haven't seen before. The reason for it is because if you look over here, normally we would start at zero on a number line, but this is starting over here at 120. Now, can you imagine if this graph had to be drawn, including all the numbers up to 120, we wouldn't even be able to fit it all onto the screen unless we had everything so squashed up, you could hardly see the bars because they would be so narrow. So what's been done over here is this little zigzag shows us that these numbers have been left out so that they could start at 120 and then go from there without having to try and fit everything before that onto the graph, which is very difficult to do. So this shows us that numbers have been left out. Okay, and that is how we work with histograms. Now that we've learned the concepts in this lesson, it's important to practice, practice, practice. If you haven't already got the worksheet that goes with this video, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description below. The worksheet comes with an extra exercise full of questions for you to work on to master the concepts covered in this lesson. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button so that others can benefit from it too. Also, be sure to subscribe so that you can easily find my other lessons and hit the bell so that you will get notified about lessons as I upload them.